Hello YouTube, my name is Zach, and today I'm going to be doing the promised 1,000 subscriber special. Thank you all so much for all of your support. We're finally there, and I don't want to dwell on it too much because we got a video to see and a singer to analyze, so I don't want to spend too much time going into this. But thank you so much for all of your support. Thank you for getting me to 1,000 subscribers. This is just the beginning. I hope that things only grow from here. Um, thank you for enjoying the content and following along with me and actually just given this music singing nerd a chance i know that uh it takes a lot to just with all the information out there just to sit for 30 minutes or whatever and watch a video of some guy ramble about singing when you could get a bite-sized video from someone else but thank you so much because i really appreciate it this is my greatest passion in my life and it makes me more than happy to be able to share it with all of you so again thank you so much and uh we'll just keep going from here and uh Let's see how it goes. Who knows where this is going to go. Um, by the way, my light source that I had before is out of commission at the moment. I'm using this very bootleg way of giving light. So it might look washed out. If it is, I'm sorry. I Not a whole lot I can do about it. So for those of you who are new to this channel, I had a 1,000 subscriber incentive that when I hit 1,000 subscribers, I was going to do a three-part series on Mike Patton. He has been far and away among the top requested singers for me to analyze because, well, he's Mike freaking Patton. Like, he just does it all. And so there's a lot to say about Mike Patton. Before I go into that, though, I want to tell you guys really quick, I have huge news. Um, it hasn't happened yet, so I don't want to, like, say a date or a time. I have a time frame. But I have gotten Ross Jennings from Haken and Einar Solberg from Leprous both to agree to interview on this channel. And if all goes according to plan, the interviews will happen in December after they're done with their tour. I got to speak with them both personally, and they both agreed. So I got their personal information, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, I told them both how much you guys have been wanting me to talk about them and how big of a request Einar specifically has been. And he said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. So look forward to that in a month. For now, you got three Mike Patton videos. Um, so, Mike Patton. He has been in a multitude of projects. He's sung every style, every genre un under the sun, and he's broken every rule of singing that is imaginable. If Mike Patton had a way to sell the way that he sings, then I would be out of business along with a bunch of other voice teachers because he does things that should not be doable with the voice. His antics and his sounds and noises and the pitches that he screeches or whatever you want to call it, those things are almost inhuman. And so I want you all to understand that are used to my content that this analysis is going to be sort of a deconstruction of what he's doing. Um, it's going to be hard for me to say you can do this in a healthy way kind of thing or anything like that. This is going to be different in the sense that I'm just going to be trying to tell you guys what's making the sounds rather than trying to provide like vocal tips. Uh, the way I plan on doing this is this video is going to be on his faith no more days and this song is falling to pieces. It was hard to find videos of Mike Patton in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. So this is the best I could get. I know a lot of you probably want to hear Epic or something, but but. I mean, that's mostly rapping, and he just sings the same chorus over and over again, so I figured this would be better. Um, next week, I'm going to go into his Mr. Bungle days. I'm probably going to analyze Carrie Stress and the Jaw. Uh, if you guys have something better, give me a recommendation in the comments with regards to which song from the Mr. Bungle era I should do. No vulgarity and no screaming. Like, Mamishka Mo Squaws probably won't work because it's, you know, nonsense. Like, it's going to be hard for me to analyze what he's doing there because there's not a lot of logic to it in the like technical sense so with all that in mind i had a few things in mind carry stress in the jaw uses a little bit of screaming but it also allows me to talk about a lot of different facets of singing as a whole so at any rate mike Patton's done it all he's sung in every style he sings in multiple languages he sung with orchestras he sung with metal bands he's he's done it all so there's very little that i could say about mike Patton in a negative sense with regards to his career as a vocalist. He's somehow maintained his voice almost perfectly all the way up until now. From a purely technical standard, he does almost everything wrong. Um, like if you took him to a jury in, you know, in a college, you know, if he was doing a classical jury, he would fail. But that's not the point with Mike Patton at all. And I think that if you watch some of his early interviews, you would hear his philosophy in that he thinks of that superhuman, like, standard held kind of concept of music making and singing is bad 
So I'm not going to necessarily apply those same standards to him. I'm Like I said, I'm just going to try to explain to you what he's doing. So without a whole lot more introduction, um, this is, if you've never seen my videos before, this is an objective vocal analysis. Um, normally I would talk about vocal health and vocal sustainability, but I feel like with Patton, you can't really talk about that because he's just defied the rules in every way. That doesn't mean that everyone can do what Mike Patton does. I honestly think that he has vocal cords of steel and he's just an absolute freak of nature that just want, comes around once every, you know, 100 years or so. Like, you just don't find me many people like Mike Patton. So I would not say that he's a model for, like, healthy vocal technique. I would not say to go out and try to mimic his sounds and plan at the same time to have a 30-year-long singing career like he has. He is an exception to the rule and... In my view as a voice teacher, if you try to treat yourself like the exception to the rule with regards to your health from the outset, you're probably going to set yourself up to fail. That doesn't mean that you can't be the kind of vocalist that he could be. You have to kind of experiment, and that I do expect singers to, you know, to do that, whether it's healthy or not. Um, but just I would say that if you're a beginning singer and you're trying to learn singing technique, don't use Mike Patton as a point of reference. Learn some fundamentals and then see what your voice is capable of once you've got some like solid, safe fundamentals that you can fall back on. With all that being said, here we go. This is Mike Patton falling to pieces from 1990. Let's check it out. So <laughs> he hasn't even started singing yet, and he's already doing something that that most singers would never even dream of doing before they try to sing something. He's jumping up and down. That uses cardiovascular effort. I don't see how he does the things that he does, like jumps around and flails around on stage like he tends to and still has enough breath to be able to sing. He could just be in prime physical shape. But even so, very rarely do you see people who can sing with any degree of consistency who jump around like this. So the first thing that you can notice about Mike Patton, he does have kind of a different timbre in the early stages of his career as in the later stage of his career. And I think that it probably benefited him better later in his career because this sound I would deem as extremely wide amateure, very frontal, very nasal, and pretty much all of his material from this era sounds like that. He does some screaming and things, and he does a little bit deeper sounding timbre every now and then, but most of the time it's this very frontal, very nasal sound, and given the, the wide palette of sounds he can create vocally, him singing in this style was actually pretty limiting to him because it forced his timbre into a very specific kind of like edge and sound. When you use all that facial resonance, when you use all that frontal stuff, it, it just makes your voice have a very unique, distinctive kind of bite on it that doesn't happen if you don't use nasal resonance. It's not easily replicated in any other way than using your nose. So the nasal resonance was stifling to his tone, and I'm sure that he probably made adjustments as he got older to allow himself to make more vocal sounds. There's no way he was going to be able to do some of those screams that he does with this timbre. You just you just can't. The mechanism doesn't open up enough when you have this like really frontal high larynx thing like he does. Yeah, so you can even see the way he's holding his microphone. That's kind of a staple of a lot of Mike Patton's live stuff. Um, he he holds his mic in weird places to help create different sounds, but you can see how much his lips are widening. I and I sings wah wah wah. He kind of gets that thing going on a lot, and that's a byproduct of the open wide embouchure. So what he's doing is is very different from the way I would typically teach someone to sing to start out. You know, when when you when you start out singing one of the most important elements to teach someone is that the text is important and clarity of words and using vowels that allow your voice to sort of create the ideas musically and textually that you want to when you sing like he's effectively singing vowels that don't really match the words that he's speaking and i mean in all fairness this is a characteristic of his singing throughout his career i mean there are times when you listen to songs that he does with mr bungle where his words are straight up indecipherable because of the way he's delivering them. So here Mike Patton is already showing a propensity as a vocalist to use his singing sound more in 
a method of creating an effect than one of trying to create a like a bel canto beautiful singing sound he's trying to create effects with his voice and i know that a lot of people who talk about harsh vocals and things like that kind of look at it that way like you're creating a vocal effect and and that's okay i mean even in the you know the vocal health realm using the frontal resonance with the wide embouchure it's not destructive to you it's just it hampers the sounds that you create you're only going to get a very specific subset of singing sounds with this sort of configuration So in this part right here, where he's singing the da 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 da, I don't know the words of the song, but when he's singing that lower range, it almost sounds like that low end is very thin, and it sounds like it doesn't have a lot of depth on it. But when you listen to his later material, which we will in future videos, you hear that that lower end has depth and it has fullness. And so the reason that it doesn't have that same fullness as his later material is because all his resonance is way up here. So if I try to go down low like that, it doesn't have the richness where if I keep things open and I start speaking down in my low range, like if I start getting this thing going on, it has a lot more resonance and fullness than with everything stuffed up in the front of his face. So the effect that he is creating with his voice is limiting the amount of resonance and ring he gets in his lower pitches. So you can even hear there it's subtle, but if you go back and listen to the word vision on the first vowel of vision, it was it was not as nasal as the un vowel. So it was like vision, vision. You, if you go back and listen, let me let me demonstrate it for you. Just listen specifically for the word vision. How the first half of the word isn't nasal, but the second half of the word is. You hear the v was more more open sounding in the on the vision sound like ah like a wah that, that's him doing that sound that he's creating so you know that's just a clear example of you being able to hear a difference of how his voice can sound without the nasal and with the nasal stuff Yeah, he's clearly struggling with the low stuff here, which is not characteristic for his voice as, as you know he developed. Now, another thing here is he was pretty young in this. If I'm not mistaken, he was in his early 20s. And so as we've talked about in the past, the larynx hardens as you age. And the hardening of the larynx changes the voice's entire structure and its ability to maintain various pitches. It's not uncommon to see tenors turn into baritones or to see baritones turn into basses or see basses turn into baritones just as the voice ages. So it could just be that his voice isn't fully matured yet. And as a result, his low pitches are harder for him to, to create. Now, before I get this question in the comments, and I know I will, probably even if I address it now, it doesn't matter what Mike Patton's voice type is. He could be a tenor. He could be a baritone. I don't think that you can categorize a voice used in this way in any specific voice type. I mean, he clearly has used his voice in so many different fashions, from voice acting to video game voiceovers to, to singing, that the, the voice type doesn't matter. If, if I had to give him a voice type... I would probably say he's a baritone because most of his modal register singing is in a baritone range, but he just uses his voice in so many different ways that that I don't even know if that's an accurate assessment because of how like the in between 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 that's not that low like that's like a mid voice for me as a baritone so he struggles with that here so by that argument you could say he's a tenor so I I don't know I think trying to categorize his voice type is pretty a pretty irrelevant thing. I don't think it matters that much. Yeah, you can hear how many of his words just don't sound like real words, and that is strictly a byproduct of his embouchure usage. The, the lip and tongue shaping are the most important elements of making your words sound clear. I mean, if I talk I all the time, everything would sound strange. You know, everything is distorted and weird and your vowels don't make sense when you when you widen your embouchures out like that. You, you can't really create the proper sound to make your vowel sound like the vowel that it is when your embouchures are that wide. You know, it's not destructive any more than being a little too tight when you sing is, but if anything, it's it just uses muscles inefficiently like having your eye like this it just engages your cheeks too much that kind of thing but it's it's 
it's not the end of the world. I mean, there are far worse habits you could have with regards to your specific vocal health. In the classical setting, we just say that that embouchure usage is just kind of unrefined. So, you know, but in rock and in metal, like, who cares about unrefined, right? It doesn't matter. So I wouldn't dwell too much on his embouchures and just accept that it's creating an effect that he's trying to, you know, trying to create. Yeah, so you can clearly see that super wide embouchure right there. And another thing to point out is when he's singing this low stuff, it sounds like it's very, not breathy, but it sounds like it's just, it doesn't have much substance. If you pay really close attention, the video quality doesn't make it any easier. If you pay very close attention to his breathing, you're hearing like a, <gasps> like kind of that sound. And that definitely is indicative of a lack of a low breathing mechanism he, he's not getting the diaphragmatic breath thing going on now you'll all see that his breathing his breath support is much better um, he gets a lot of low diaphragmatic breaths when he does a lot of the singing in the future and i think he has to to create some of the sounds that he creates but at this point in his career it's pretty obvious that that he didn't have training uh, at least not at the start of his career because so many of these fundamentals that he ends up adjusting in the future just just aren't there and i think that you'll find that some of the fundamentals that he ends up developing are what kind of unlocks all these sounds that he creates you can listen to things like on epic when he does that like what is it thing you, you know what i'm talking about i probably did that horribly but but that whole thing, like he always took an interest in making sounds with his voice along with singing. But I think that him developing some vocal fundamentals later actually helped him unlock that more. And, and I promise in the coming weeks, I'll go into that a little bit more. I just want to focus on him now. Now, it's again, it's super blurry, but you can see that he doesn't have really any facial tension. So it's not that he's pushing or straining or anything like that. This is all pretty middle of his voice. It's not super high. Like me as a baritone, I could probably sing this song and it'd be comfortable in my range. So it, he's not using tension. He's keeping everything in a pretty nice, even place in his voice. You know, I think there's just a facial resonance and the lack of breath support that kind of creates this like, eh, kind of edgy overly i would call it overly bright timbre it was also a fad of the time with you know the, a lot of these 80s bands to do this really nasal bright sound so he could have just been following a fad he's always also been known to kind of take you know fads or like popular singing or singers and make fun of them or duplicate what they do in like absurd ways like anthony kiedis from red hot chili peppers is an obvious example but you know he's always done that so it could have just been him trying to like cash in or capitalize on a, on a fad vocally. And that, that's always very possible too. There's no way to know without asking him. And I highly doubt Mike Patton will be willing to do an uh, interview on this channel. Although, although if you guys tweet him, like send him like a like flood of social media, he might. I don't know. Give it a shot. Maybe he'd be willing to chat with me about this stuff. I don't know what words he was singing there, but when he sung the low note and he tightened his lips up, like he kind of did this thing. When you restrict your embouchure by pushing your lips out that much, you have to tighten your jaw. So like if you pucker your lips, you can feel like right underneath here, all this stuff tighten up. So when you sing from that configuration, you are overly tightening your jaw, your neck muscles, and your tongue. And what that ends up doing is it restricts all of the sound. It restricts the freedom of the mechanism. Like everything you do up here that tightens around in this area directly connects the larynx and everything below it. So he really almost had no sound on that low note, probably because he kept his mouth so closed that it didn't allow the, any space. If you have ever seen my videos where you see the like hourglass shape for embouchures, with men, as the hourglass opens, as the pitch goes down, you want to open up more. And that doesn't mean to go, ah, ah, but that's overdoing it. But you can definitely lower your jaw a little bit. Ah, like when you move down in pitch, it's okay to open up a little bit to, to give yourself a little bit more space for the sound to, to resonate, to take some of the weight off of every other mechanism that's really working pretty hard to be able to move down that low. So effectively, what I'm saying in all this is that if you're singing low, one of the worst things you can do is pucker up, tighten everything up. Give yourself a little bit more space. Don't widen your embouchure like he is, but definitely drop your jaw a little bit, typically speaking. And I'm sure in this case, he could have gotten more sound if he just opened his mouth just a tad more and not puckered his lips out. Somebody put me together. 
Wah! Like, <laughs> I, I mean, he certainly can't think that that's the word together, you know, like together. Wah! It actually, I mentioned this, I think, in my Casey Crescenzo video that in gospel choir, when I sung in that for a little while, like that's how they did a lot of their vowels, like everything. I'll never forget, I think we sung the word Jordan, like, um, I, from I was like a the river of Jordan or something like that, and we went Jordan, and I'll never forget that. Like it's just this overly wide embouchure, and it creates a specific sound. So you know that could be what he's going for. But you know, if you're singing the word together, typically you might go together, you know, or together. You know, you you typically don't want to go together because that just sounds kind of hickish and you know to America. You know what I mean? But so if you if you just say together or together that that might help but yeah you certainly don't go together why <laughs> but as you're gonna see from mike patton in the coming videos that's just his thing he just makes weird noises a lot of the time okay so you actually did have that jumping effect of sound there because if you go back and listen while he's jumping you hear his pitches go sharp and if you remember what i said about being sharp in the past usually going sharp is indicative of overexertion, which makes sense he's working his whole body jumping up and down so if you're going sharp you're usually thinking too hard or you're working too hard and so with all those pitches being sharp like that, all that work he's doing with his body is probably causing his voice to kind of work in overdrive. Go back and listen. I'm going to let you hear it so you can hear how sharp he was when he sings that phrase. And notice that the second he stops jumping, his pitches kind of like even back out and get closer to the correct ones. Now, Mike Patton's a showman. He's trying to put on a show. He's being a front man. His audience is probably willing to forgive him a couple of spotty pitches here and there, which is fine. And most of the time, he's remarkably consistent with his pitch acuity. So, you know, that it's not the end of the world, but that's just a really good example of how overexertion can lead your pitches to going sharp. So to create that ah, kind of thing, it takes a lot of pressure. Like if I make that sound, ah, ah, like I, I can feel pressure building up in the bottom of my throat. I don't know if it's subglottal or superglottal pressure. Honestly, I, I don't know. I mean, analyzing the sounds it creates on like a scientific level is going to be extremely difficult without having some sort of like scope attached to what he's doing. So all I can do is guess and tell you how it feels when I make those sounds. I feel lower throat pressure, which means that it, the pressure is either right above the glottis or right below the glottis, and I don't know which, but um, it, to make that like really thin push sound, he's clearly putting a lot of pressure on his folds. It would also explain why the pitch isn't super clear. It's just kind of like, Wah. it just sounds kind of like there, but the pitch isn't, it, it's present, but it's not a full part of the sound. You know, you can usually hear when someone sings a balance between the singing voice quality sound and the pitch. Well, here the pitch is kind of on the back burner and the sound quality is there more than anything. And that's kind of what happens when you sing with a fry. Like when you fry, you actually do have a pitch on the, like if you go, ah, like there's actually a pitch there, but the quality of the sound predominates over the pitch itself. And that's similar to what he's doing here. So it could just be that he's doing some sort of weird vocal fry, but my guess is as good as yours on that one. I can only kind of go by what I hear. You know, I haven't shown much of this rapping stuff yet, but I I, I just saw this and it made me think, like, when he does the rap, he takes it out of his nose and it's all like speaking. So he's clearly got a different concept of what singing is than his rapping elements here. And, and that leads me to believe that it's probably something that he trained himself to do. That the nasal sound is probably something he trained himself to do at a young age. And if I remember, most of his stuff from this era sounds like that. And so he probably taught himself to sing that way, thinking that that's the way that he sings. And then he got some training. And now, I don't know. I don't know. He might not have had a day of training in my life. I could be a total idiot. You know, let me know in the comments. Any huge fans of his, let me know. Um, also, I know you guys probably have specific questions about him too. Please ask them in the comments. I'll try to address them in the next video. So when you put your head out like this, everything tightens up. Like if, if you just stick your head in the air and you touch 
you could feel these muscles tightening. So ah, everything feels tight when you do that. The larynx can't really move. Oh, it makes me like want to puke. <laughs> that wasn't fun. Um, so like yeah, lowering the larynx is very difficult with your head up like that. This is not something that would typically create a singing sound, and this is just yet another example of of. Mike Patton sort of just breaking all the rules and just doing things that most human beings can't do. And and some of this stuff I'm not going to have an explanation for. I'm just going to have to point it out and say, well, that's what he's doing. I don't know how, but that's what he's doing. And this is a clear example of it. Yeah, so the, the phrases are starting to tail off and it's just being replaced with like... <sighs> with breath. And if you remember my Devin Townsend video, the first video I ever did in this format, I said something similar where you start hearing this like tail off where he's like, Ugh. he's talking, he'll go, Ugh. he'll go like that at the end. That's a sign of fatigue. And that's usually a sign your heart's beating really fast. And you know, you you're running out of air because you're breathing really heavily. So I would think that maybe he's starting to feel a little bit fatigued at this point. It's interesting because in this little phrase, he's moving in and out of having the nasal and the non-nasal. At the beginning of put me to get, like put me to, he'll use the non-nasal and t on together, he'll go gah, nah, like kind of like that. He's moving the resonance in his vocal tract. Like there's no question. He's changing the placement of the resonance. I just don't know if it's deliberate or not. I'm sorry for sounding like a broken record. I, I don't know if, I don't know if he's consciously trying to make those changes or not. There's no real way to know. Yeah, even just those notes. When he goes, Gada, he goes like that. And the first few notes are not nasal at all. And the second ones are. So, you know, it's just the sound he's creating. So that was all lower larynx, open vowel, not frontal resonance. Except, I guess he kind of shifted it a little bit at the end. But that sound there was almost like he's controlling the placement of it so maybe he's fooled me all along maybe he's just making the sound because he wants to and he's mike Patton, so he may very well be and that's it so um first off analyzing this dude is tough uh because so much of this stuff just defies everything that i've ever learned that i'm having to sort of piece everything together no pun intended um to be able to figure out a way to describe it. And it's not a lack of knowledge that I have or anything like that. It's just that the way that he creates sound is so distinctive and so unique and he just does things that other people don't do that he, he defies the norm. A lot of times when I make these sort of assessments, it's based on sort of like this bell curve approach. Most people kind of fall somewhere around the middle. But he's such an outlier. Like he's so way out on the flat end of the curve that... that you can't really assign a whole lot of specific technical details to his sound, especially considering how long his career has been and how, how consistent he's been. And, you know, it could just go back to that whole thing that I've been saying since the very beginning. You should use your voice and you should stick with the sounds that your voice makes. And it could just be that the sounds he creates are easy for his voice to create. And if that's the case, then he is just as I said at the beginning of this video, a freak of nature. He's got vocal vocal folds of steel, and he is a rare breed. So that's it for this first analysis. There's more coming. Uh, Mr. Bungle will be next week, and then I think after that I'm going to do one of the videos that he sung in Italian so I can kind of give you a different approach. I hope all three of these videos, and Faith No More, Mr. Bungle, and the Italian stuff, give you a really wide range of sounds that he creates. And hopefully that'll give you guys some perspective as to just how versatile he is and how from a voice teacher's perspective, he's just the ultimate anomaly. And it doesn't make sense that he does things the way that he does. If you have any other videos that you would suggest for me to analyze instead of Carrie Stress and the Jaw next week from Mr. Mungle, please feel free. I consider something like Retro Vertigo, um, Pink Cigarette, stuff like that. And if you guys prefer to see that, let me know in the comments. But I think that Carrie Stress in the Jaw shows his range so much, and it lets me kind of address the scream stuff a little bit, which, I mean, I think it's worth mentioning because there are some very unique, distinctive characteristics of his sound that are worth pointing out. But if you have any suggestions of a video for Mr. Bungle, let me know. And none of the ones where he's wearing, like, the... the <laughs> he, I think there's some videos where he wears a... Uh, 
like pantyhose on his head, like none of those, because I can't see what he's doing there. Um, so yeah, let me know uh, if you have any questions. I'll try to do a quick Q and A in my next video as well, so that you guys can, you know, maybe I can address a few things specifically. And I hope that this is informative. Anyway, that's it. Uh, you guys know the deal. Please like if you have not subscribed. Please subscribe. Look forward to the next video. There will be more to it for sure. Um, I do have a Patreon, as you all know. I'll put the link in the description. Please join my Discord server because there are so many people in there and there's so many great conversations. It gives you a chance to interface with me directly and ask me questions that you might have. I try to check it as much as I can. I also do give voice lessons. If you're interested in taking voice lessons, please feel free to reach out to me. And if you need anything, just let me know in the comments. So uh, thanks again for watching, guys. Thank you so much for 1,000 subscribers. It's mind-blowing to me, and this has changed my life. And I'm enamored and I am thrilled to be able to do this for you all. So uh, thank you again. I'll see you all next week with part two of Mike Patton. Thanks. Bye.